Greetings. Uh, my name is Bill Fletcher. I'm the co-coordinator of the campaign to end the Moroccan occupation of the Western Sahara. And I want to welcome you to what will be the first in a series of webinars on the struggle of the people of the Western Sahara, the Sahrawis, for national self-determination, complete independence. The Western Sahara, once colonized as the so-called Spanish Sahara, has been a site of a struggle for national sovereignty and self-determination by the indigenous people, the Sahrawis, against the Moroccan invaders since 1975. The campaign to end the Moroccan occupation of the Western Sahara, along with the Institute for the Black World 21st Century and the Pan-African Unity Dialogue, have set out to begin a series of webinars to raise awareness around the struggle going on in Western Sahara but also to encourage action to shift US policy on the question of the Western Sahara and ultimately to support the Sahrawis in their fight to drive the Moroccan occupiers out of their country. The, uh, in order to uh, begin this program, we have a wonderful panel and I wanna uh, do brief introductions and then we're gonna jump into uh, questions. This is not gonna be speeches, this is going to be a discussion, a panel discussion. And to help us uh, bring light to the subject, we're going to, which is, and we're going to be focusing this evening particularly on the question of background and the current situation, we're honored to have Ambassador Sidi Omar, who is the representative of the Frente Polisario, the liberation movement in the Western Sahara, and the Sarari Arab Democratic Republic, the uh, uh, government in exile to the United Nations. We also have joining us, Caitlin Thomas, an attorney and a former Minerso member. Uh, and I will we'll explain what Minerso was. That in, in brief, that was the UN mission, or is the UN mission. She's also the author of The Emperor's Clothes, The Naked Truth About Western Sahara. And finally, we have Dr. Jacob Mundy, who's a professor and director of peace and conflict studies at Colgate University and the co-author of Western Sahara, War, Nationalism, and Conflict Irresolution. I want to just add that uh, should you be inspired by tonight's program and wish to support the work of the campaign, you should feel free to go to our website at freewestonsahara.org and please feel free to make a contribution to our work. This is at this point a volunteer operation, but we are doing an exceptional job of bringing attention and we need more assistance and you, the listeners and viewers, can make that kind of contribution and also join us in this effort. So I want to welcome all of you and I want to welcome our guests to tonight's program. Um, I, I want to begin with a question to you, Ambassador. And, and basically, uh, the Moroccan government uh, in launching in effect an invasion of the Western Sahara in 1975 has made the argument that the Western Sahara is a legitimate part of historical Morocco. And I, I, there are, I would like you to respond to this because I mean, after all, Europeans divided up Africa uh, to serve their own interests. Why is it that there is a independent Sahrawi question when it comes to the Western Sahara? Well, good evening to everybody. I'm glad to see um, uh, Caitlin and, and Jacob on this uh, panel. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for the invitation and also for your uh, commendable efforts uh, to raise awareness about the question of Western Sahara, not only uh, in the United States of America, but also beyond. Well, to answer your question, the, the answer is actually very simple and it has been answered in a very clear way. Uh, to whom does Western Sahara belong? The International Court of Justice, which is the judge of the international community, answered these questions already in 1975 by ruling that Western Sahara did not belong to no one. It did belong to someone, first, and second, that Morocco uh, uh, did not have any sovereignty over Western Sahara. And in that sense, it did answer the question in a way to say that Western Sahara did belong to the Sahrawi people. That was the essence of the ruling of the International Court of Justice 
uh, on, uh, issued on the 16th of October 1975. And of course, that was done based on it is uh, examination of a variety of sources, written, oral, and so on, so, so forth. So that answers this question uh, very simple. And it's mm -hmm. that uh, Saharawi entity uh, that existed in Western Sahara, resisted the Spanish colonialism, was the, the, the basis of Saharawi modern nationalism uh, on which uh, uh, the whole struggle has been based, uh, these distinctive and different entity, uh, which is the Saharawi people, now politically and diplomatically represented by the Frente Polisario as internationally recognized the uh, sole and legitimate representative of the people of Western Sahara. Thank you. And, and Caitlin Thomas, can you explain in 91, 1991, the UN uh, helped to negotiate a ceasefire and then there were multiple years of discussions, negotiations towards a referendum to end the conflict. And many people thought the conflict was going to end by the end of the 90s. You were directly involved in this. What happened? Why, why, didn't, why wasn't this resolved then? Well, that's very simple. Um, I was the official of Minerso responsible for legal affairs. And my first mission when I got to the territory was to convince the Polisario to agree to the expanded criteria for voting eligibility that had been put forth by Morocco. You should know that initially when um, the agreement uh, was reached between Morocco and the Polisario and the UN, they had agreed that the criteria for eligibility would be based upon a census of the population that was created by the Spanish back in 1974, prior to the, um, the Moroccan invasion of the territory when Spain was preparing to allow the people of the territory to have a referendum of self-determination. But Morocco didn't like this because they thought it was too restrictive. So they wanted to expand these criteria. And the first thing that I did when I was in the territory was convince the Polisario that they should go along with these expanded criteria. I won't go, go into what those criteria were, but they were all based upon ties to the territory. Um, either people whose fathers were <clears throat> born in the territory or people who had lived there a certain number of years and who were members of the Sarawan tribe. In any event, they, they all had ties to the territory, significant ties to the territory. Now, the Posar didn't want to go along with these criteria initially because they thought that they were an open invitation to fraud on the part of Morocco. But they finally decided they would go along, go along with it. And it was on the basis of these criteria that the Identification Commission of Minerso started interviewing people who uh, declared that they should be eligible to vote in the referendum. Now, throughout the period of time that we were interviewing these people, Morocco tried many attempts to pad the voters list with people who were clearly not eligible under the criteria that they themselves had proposed. In 1999, Minerso finally revealed the voters list that we had prepared. And Morocco found for the first time that we had rejected a large number of these people who were bogus applicants. And when Morocco saw that all of these applicants that they had proposed were being rejected, and that the people who were left on the list would probably vote for independence, they simply decided to pull out of the referendum entirely. Now, this was not because of any disagreements over voter eligibility criteria. This is the excuse Morocco gave for this, the, their, their decision to withdraw from, from the process. It's not true. They never raised any objection to the criteria that we were using until they saw that the voters list was not in their favor. Now, by that time, James Baker had been appointed the envoy, special envoy of the Secretary General of the, of the UN to Western. Former Secretary Sahara. of State, James Baker, right. Yes, and, 
And he tried every conceivable permutation of the agreement between the parties to get the Moroccans to agree to allow this referendum to take place. There were many, agree many proposals of his. One of them was called a framework agreement, another was the peace plan. I will go into the details of them. But at the end, Morocco rejected all of them and decided that it would not allow any kind of plan to go forward, which could possibly result in the independence of Western Sahara. At that point, the UN decided to just abandon this whole idea of a referendum and to ask the parties to, to go into negotiations for a political solution to the problem. And they've been trying to, to go through a political solution to the problem ever since that time. The problem is that Morocco has maintained its position that even though it might allow a form of autonomy for Western Sahara, it would now not allow anything that would possibly lead to an independent state there. And the Polisario for their point, their um, position was that they would not accept anything that would preclude the possibility of independence. And that's where we stand today. And we'll come back to that in a second. The uh, Dr. Uh, Jacob Mundi, uh, I guess the question I wanna ask you is, why is, why is this issue of the Western Sahara of any relevance to, to those of us in the United States? I mean, you know, frankly, Jacob, the, when I mention the Western Sahara, there are many people that think, I'm just talking about like a, a portion of the Sahara Desert. They don't even know that there's a country. Why should, why should anyone really care? Well, they should care because they paid for it, at least in terms of the Moroccan occupation. Uh, Morocco received more <clears throat> U.S. aid than any other African country during the Cold War than Egypt. Uh, and as we all know, Egypt has received an extraordinary amount of money uh, due to after the uh, Camp David peace accords. Uh, Morocco was second to that, and most of that funding came during the war in Western Sahara, which lasted between 1975 and 1991, between Morocco and Polisario. If not for that aid, Morocco might not have been able to hold on to the territory. Now, France was strongly involved in supporting Morocco and still, and still is, and Saudi Arabia helped finance Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara. But from the perspective of your average taxpayer, you could point out that, you know, like Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and other territories, uh, it's been subsidized by uh, American taxpayers. And that's uh, one thing that's worth pointing out. The other thing that is worth pointing out is that, um, as James Baker said, following Trump's declaration on Western Sahara, that the United States is a country founded on the principle of self-determination. And international law with regards to Western Sahara is utterly clear in terms of the uh, there can be no final status imposed on the territory unless the people uh, the indigenous people of Western Sahara sign off on it, right? So this is this is a fundamental American value, and it's a fundamental principle of the international system that was created after 1945. So as much as Biden and Blinken can talk about a world-based international order, they're not quite living up to that when it comes to Western Sahara. Bill, can I comment on that? Please, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think there's another very practical reason why the U.S. should care about this, and that is that the Sahrawis want to establish what would be essentially a democratic system of government in Western Sahara, which would be one of the few um, democratic types of governments in the Middle East, North African area. And uh, they have shown that that is the kind of government they want to establish by the kind of government they have already established in their government in exile, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. And I think that um, it would serve US public pol foreign policy interests greatly to have a democratic government in Western Sahara, especially when it's contrasted with the kind of government that exists in Morocco where we have one of the last of the, the uh, total um, monarchical controlled governments. 
And um, there's no reason why we should allow that government to exist in Western Sahara um, rather than a democratic system of government. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, thir 30 years since this truce was uh, uh, signed and a ceasefire until uh, this past November, um, uh, Caitlin was talking about the Moroccans have essentially repudiated the idea of a referendum uh, and that the UN is trying to want a political solution. What is the political solution? I mean, what's the incentive for Morocco to back down from its position? Well, basically because of the impunity that it has always enjoyed and the support that uh, it receives from uh, key members of the Security Council and, 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 and beyond. And uh, let me just exactly as you said, uh, 30 years of a ceasefire that was uh, accepted as the first step to create the necessary security and safety conditions for the holding of the referendum. So the ceasefire was part of a package leading to the holding of the free and fair referendum uh, for the people of Western Sahara. Now, 30 years uh, later, as we speak now, there is no ceasefire. Morocco made uh, sure that the referendum uh, was almost impossible to be held. And we're back to square one. Uh, and as I said, because uh, first of all, Morocco has never had any genuine political will actually to go for a peaceful solution. It all, was all along a game played to trying to uh, win the hearts and minds of the Sahrawis and normalize an illegal occupation, counting on the support that it is to uh, continue to receive from the international community. And that with time uh, is what created the impression among many, including uh, policymakers, that this is a low intensity conflict. Yeah, so it could be left uh, um, to resolve itself uh, in terms of the power relations uh, uh, among the parties. That situation has dramatically changed now since the 13th of November. It's no longer a low intensity conflict. It may escalate further. And that's where, and I'm back to the question that we asked it, agree completely with uh, Jacob Mundy, why the United uh, States should care, or the Americans should care about this conflict. It is because their successive governments have helped Morocco to entrench its illegal occupation of parts of Western Sahara. And since we're speaking about a democratic government, that government should be accountable to its own people. And the Americans should uh, hold their government accountable for all the support that diplomatic and military that they have or continue to give uh, to Morocco. But with that support comes the responsibility. And this is why the Sahrawi people have always looked to the United States of America base it on those very principles of self-determination and so on to contribute to the peaceful solution of this conflict, given its privileged relationship with Morocco, the so-called first country to recognize and so on, so on, so forth. So the United States of America has a role to play, being a member, permanent member of the Security Council, but also because of its direct involvement in this conflict and the suffering that it has caused uh, uh, to our people. So I'd like to ask this question to the three of you, uh, um, building off of what you were just saying, Ambassador, but uh, um, Caitlin and Jacob, if you want to add all, also, who are the international players and what is their, what is their stake in this? Uh, and uh, I mean, without giving away everything, I know that France is involved, but like, so what, why are the French involved? What about the Spanish? Who else is involved in this and, and what are the, what's, what's at stake for them? We can start with you, Ambassador, but anyone could speak on this one. Um, yes, uh, you mentioned France and Spain. Spain is the former colonial power, which is the Sahara. It should have led the country to a smooth process of decolonization. They did not do that. And instead um, uh, entered an agreement with the two neighboring countries, Morocco and Mauritania to divide the territory, and that's why Spain is still considered, and even by the Spanish legal standard, to be the administering power 
uh, diuri of Western Sahara. France is also another key player uh, because of its colonial history in North Africa, and particularly its privileged relationship with Morocco, which is seen considered, I can say that, by uh, the French political class as an extension actually of the French influence in North uh, Africa, and obviously because of its history in that part of the world, and uh, we know uh, very well, those familiar with the region, uh, what, what was that history in terms of its colonial presence in neighboring Algeria and, and, and then Morocco and how that ended uh, in the, case, the Algerian case, uh, case after a heroic struggle that drove mm -hmm. the French outside of uh, Algeria that used to be considered uh, French, l'Algérie Française. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, on the other side, independence was granted to, the, um, to Morocco based on, on an agreement for the existence of a, a certain type of, of political regime. So that, that I think uh, is still there. The French have not unfortunately been able to overcome this colonial uh, uh, hangover. And because of that, they continue to meddle and interfere in the affairs of, of our, uh, uh, that part of, of, of Africa. These are the, the immediate European uh, powers that have a uh, stake in the question of Western Sahara. And of course, we've uh, just spoken about the United States of America uh, and, and, and others, but I'm sure uh, Caitlin and Jacob may have more on this. Please, Caitlin or Jacob, anything that you want to add on that? Well, I'll, I'll just add that the EU itself as a, as a body has not played a very cooperative uh, role in this conflict, that it's more or less beholden to Spanish and French interests. And that's what's been driving a series of trade agreements between Morocco and the EU that have involved products from Western Sahara. Now, recently we saw uh, for the third time that the EU Court of Justice has struck down this agreement saying, not only is Western Sahara not, not a part of Morocco as far as international law is concerned, but now we have a very clear uh, judgment from the EU court that Polisario is an unnamed third party uh, to these agreements. Uh, so again, it reflects uh, what was said earlier that Polisario's international status as the representative of the Western Saharan people is very clear. Uh, and yet the EU is uh, once again, uh, starting to make movement uh, to have another trade agreement despite being struck down three times by the courts. Hmm. Caitlin, did you wanna add anything on it? Well, not about that, but I'd like to backstep a bit and talk about the U.S. role in all of this. Please. Because, because from the very beginning of this conflict, the United States has um, performed a very nefarious role in, in all of it. Um, when Spain was getting ready to give the Sahrawis a referendum under which they can choose whether to be an independent country or whatever else they wanted in their future. That was back in 1974. Morocco pressured the United States to arm twist Spain to agree to withdraw from the territory and to allow Morocco and Mauritania to control it basically. And, and Morocco was, was able to do this because of Henry Kissinger. And Henry Kissinger, who used Morocco as a surrogate in Africa for things that the United States were, was prohibited from law from doing, especially in Angola. And mm -hmm. Morocco was part of what they call the Safari Club of nations who would step in and, and uh, try to quell liberation movements around the world uh, when the United States needed it. So Henry Kissinger wanted to keep Morocco on the side of the US in these surrogate battles. So it, he was more than willing to arm twist Spain to withdraw from the territory and allow Morocco and Mauritania to infiltrate it. And if it wasn't for that, Spain would have given the inhabitants of the territory a referendum back in 1975 after the decision of the Court of Justice. And we wouldn't have had this problem to begin with. And ever since that time, 
the position of the United States, even though it claimed publicly that it was is in favor of self-determination and law and the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera, basically did everything in its power to make things turn out the way Morocco wanted. And I can't go into the reasons for this. It varied throughout the years. If you're more interested in this subject, you can find it in books um, that have been written on it, including mine. But um, the United States basically caused this problem to exist in the first place. So we have a duty, an obligation to the people, the Sahrawis, to make sure it ends on equitable terms. Thank you on that. Um, there's a question that someone's raised uh, that I'm gonna to direct uh, to you, Ambassador, and um, background to it. What you, the listeners, may or may not know is that when the uh, Moroccans invaded, they called it the Green March. And um, I've seen photos of this and videos, and, and it most resembles when white settlers barged into Oklahoma in the 1890s to seize land in masses number, masses of people marching into the Western Sahara at the behest of the king, along with troops in order to seize land. And, and one of the questions that's been raised is, were there supporters of, uh, among the Sararis? Was there any significant support among the Sararis for a unification with Morocco? Ambassador? Uh, well, no, uh, because, um, and that's on record by the United Nations uh, visiting mission to Western Sahara in summer 1975, uh, which interviewed Sahrawis living in the then Spanish Sahara, and Algeria, Mauritania, and Morocco. And there was a unanimous support for the independence of Western Sahara and opposition to integration with any neighboring country. That was a very clear message sent by the Saharawis at the time. Uh, so there was no any, any, any Saharawi or any group, politically organized group that uh, called for integration with any of the neighboring country, despite the fact that uh, uh, the dictatorial uh, regime in, in Spain at the time set up actually a, a party called the Unity Party to a, advocate for unity with uh, motherland Spain, but that was a colonial creation that had nothing uh, to, to do in, in terms of representing the will of the Sahrawi people, which was massively represented by the Frente Polisario, as also testified to by the same United Nations visiting uh, uh, mission. And as you said, indeed, that was a, the invasion by over 300,000 Moroccans, uh, driven and fought, supported by the Moroccan regime to force uh, Spain's hand at the time and to be the, the beginning of what later on came as the uh, uh, military invasion of our territory using force and bombing civilians and different uh, many villages and, and civilians. And uh, that was the, the beginning of what has continued up to now as the uh, Moroccan military occupation of our land, which also, as you know, it was not only Morocco, but also joined uh, by Mauritania at the time, mm -hmm. the two neighboring, uh, moving on these small and peaceful people who are just, uh, were, were about to reap the fruits of our anti-colonial uh, struggle against Spain when we were surprised by the two neighboring uh, countries invading and dividing our country. So one of the questions that's been asked, and I, I'm asked this regularly, and it, it's come up uh, uh, this evening, is um, that I'd like to pose to the three of you, is uh, what are the, are, are there multiple reasons that Morocco is insisting on controlling the Western Sahara? And one of the things I was wondering if you all could address are, um, what are the natural resources that exist in the Western Sahara? And does that have anything to do with uh, Morocco's insistence that this remain or become part of uh, the Kingdom of Morocco. Whoever would like to address that. You might allow me just very briefly. Uh, this is a question I think this is what people uh, keep on asking. Why uh, 
what interest does Morocco have in Western Sahara? And I think to answer this question, I'll just go briefly and leave time for our um, other panelists. Um, but a, a, a general context for us to understand is how the modern Moroccan state came into existence and politically the ruling regime in, in, in Morocco. I, I touched on that briefly when I talked about the colonial history of French presence in North Africa. But there's one key element, and I think that's essential to understand uh, the historical narrative of the formation of the Moroccan modern state, which is the nature of the uh, ruling regime, the, the monarchy, and the shaky foundations on which this regime has uh, built itself uh, manifest in a continued and persistent lack of domestic legitimacy. And that what explains this drive impulse of this regime to expand. And we know the history. history. Morocco is the only country in that part of the world that has tried to invade by force all its neighbors. 63 Algeria, the uh, mm -hmm. sand war, claiming Western Sahara, invading it, uh, taking nine years to recognize Mauritania as an independent country, and lately assaulting, launching an assault on a Spanish isolate in the Mediterranean, considered by uh, historians as the first attack on European soil. So it's this expansionism that has become a, an ideology of the state, obviously to divert the attention of its own people, but it's also to buttress it is shake, the shaky foundation of, of this regime. So that's, I, I just leave it at that. This is the context in which we can understand this impulse or this drive behind Morocco to expand at the expense mm -hmm. of all its neighbors. The, the natural resources are there. We're not going deep on that. The, 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 the mindset at the time, the, the Cold War mindset at the time, and how Frente Polisario was, if you uh, were looked upon by the, the Americans, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But there is a persistent structural problem of legitimacy in Morocco that drives mm -hmm. this regime to expand and to use expansionism as a tool of its policy in relation to its neighbors, including Western Sahara. Caitlin and Jacob, to that question. I'll, um, I'll just add a little bit. In terms of the weakness of the Moroccan regime, ahead of the Moroccan invasion in 1975, we have to remember that the, the king barely survived two coup attempts that likely would have replaced the uh, monarchy with uh, a popular uh, populist military regime of a very sort of uh, sort that we see in the region uh, during that period. Uh, so the, the Moroccan monarch Hassan II understood that you know he his he was you know uh, living on borrowed time in terms of his legitimacy. And so the campaign to recover Western Sahara, which uh, ramped up as soon as the, the Spanish uh, declared their intent to hold a referendum in 1974. That had to do with consolidating the regime and the military around a kind of national cause uh, that could unite the people and the, the state itself uh, to take over Western Sahara. So this is why I don't think uh, the territory's phosphates, which was known at the time as one of its key assets, uh, and fisheries, which have become more important as the years gone by, I don't think those, those were motivating factors for Morocco uh, at the time. I think it had entirely to do with as... Uh, uh, Ambassador Omar says that has to do with re regime consolidation. And it seemed to have worked in a way, at least in terms of the war in Western Sahara gave the Moroccan monarchy an excuse to continue to repress opposition movements, whether it was leftist, Islamist, labor, that sort of thing. So that uh, while the United States and other allies are helping Morocco uh, hold on to Western Sahara, this is allowing the monarchy to, to repress the opposition so that the, the democratic and republican alternative to the Moroccan monarchy never, never emerges, right? Uh, and that's the other uh, consequence of uh, the war in Western Sahara, which is we've seen the snuffing out of any sort of uh, opposition with a meaningful opposition in Morocco, that the monarchy is just total and absolute. Thank you. Can I add something to that? Yes, go for um, it. In 1956, when Morocco gained its independence, the main opposition party there was the Istiqlal party. And it got its preeminence as a party 
by championing what they call the greater Morocco theory, which was that uh, Morocco really, uh, its historic borders went down to the Senegal River and half of Algeria and therefore Western Sahara and Mauritania. And this, uh, this opposition party became so popular that the, uh, the king of Morocco felt that he had to adopt the same policies in order to, to quell the influence of this party. And ever since that time, the greater Morocco theory has been the moving force behind most of the politics of, of Morocco, not only with regard to Western Sahara, but as Ambassador Omar mentioned, um, claiming parts of Algeria and claiming all of Mauritania and refusing to recognize the independence of Mauritania when Mauritania became independent. And uh, it still is the greater Morocco theory, the motivating force in Morocco for Western Sahara. So let's bring this forward to the present. Um, this background is, is uh, absolutely essential to understand uh, where, where we find ourselves. But a war restarted in November. Uh, a war restarted in November. And uh, one of the things that was being said in some of the media, to the extent that any of the uh, mainstream media was covering the situation, uh, was that this war was mainly the result of Sarari youth and refugee camps becoming impatient with Polisario and wanting something more to happen. And basically that was the trigger. Uh, Ambassador, what led to this war? Why are the sides back at war? Well, as I said before, and, uh, and uh, Caitlin uh, Thomas gave the background when we agreed on the ceasefire uh, in 1991. Uh, prior to that, we agreed on this UN or EU settlement plan in August 1988, uh, and based on two essential pillars or elements, if you will. The ceasefire, that the two parts will ceasefire to create the security and safety conditions for the United Nations to hold a free and fair referendum for the Sahrawis to decide between independence or integration with Morocco. So we laid our arms in exchange of the referendum. That was almost 30, 30 years ago. The referendum did not take place because Morocco managed to block that uh, in the face of the inaction, sheer inaction by the Security Council. And what happened on the 30th of November was that Morocco moved its troops into a buffer strip in, uh, along the Moroccan military wall in, in Western Sahara, breaking the almost 30 years of the ceasefire. That was actually what happened. And at that moment, because prior to that, we warned that if Morocco would do that, we would react. But on the 30th of November, the Frente Polisari took a decision uh, to announce the return to armed struggle as a means, not an end, to face up to the Moroccan aggression and liberate our land. Why did we take that decision? Because we were bound by a ceasefire for 30 years and we remained wholeheartedly committed to that ceasefire despite the provocative and aggressive behavior of Morocco in its attempt to normalize and legitimize its illegal occupation, we remained committed to that ceasefire. But on the 30th of November, when Morocco moved on and occupied about 40 kilometers, square kilometers of our land in the face of sheer inaction by the Security Council, the Frente Polisario, and to exercise its legitimate right to self-defense we declared loud and clear that we were no longer bound by the ceasefire because we could not exercise that legitimate right to self-defense while being bound by the ceasefire agreement. So indeed, on the 30th of November, we decided to uh, disengage from the ceasefire in order 
to face up to the Moroccan new aggression and our land. And that was the beginning of the war, which is still going on uh, uh, to this moment in Western Sahara. Um, one of the questions that was uh, asked while we've been discussing this uh, uh, made me think about uh, what's going on in Morocco. And Jacob, you had started to, you talked a little bit about this, you and actually, you and Caitlin both. Um, is there an anti-occupation movement within uh, Morocco? I, I had an experience uh, with uh, some trade unionists from uh, uh, Northern Africa, and particularly from Morocco, who seemed to be really progressive, except when the issue of the Western Sahara came up. In which case they they had a real chauvinist attitude towards the Western Sahara. The Western Sahara was theirs, and I, I'm just curious: is there any kind of anti-occupation movement to speak of within Morocco? And anyone can answer that question. I would say that um, th there does exist support uh, for self-determination in Western Sahara, but it's it's very marginal in Moroccan society. You would find it among elements of the left, former Communist Party, um, and uh, even to a strange extent uh, among uh, Islamist extremists who view the Moroccan monarch as a kind of uh, apostate who poses himself as the commander of the faithful, uh, which is a, uh, under some Salafi readings, not exactly the, uh, the strict understanding of Islam. Uh, but for the most part, any support for Western Sahara uh, was driven out of uh, the society uh, through brute repression, that uh, any, any voicing of support for Western Saharan self-determination uh, could be repressed. King Hassan II, in his own memoirs, said the rights of humans stop at the question of Western Sahara. And the you know, leftist uh, Moroccan writer, Tahar Ben Jaloun, in one of his novels about the secret prison of Tazmamart, said that in that prison, uh, which was filled with all sorts of you know, opposition figures and military dissenters and coup plotters, that there was a, a special place for, for Western Saharans, uh, which, was the, which was even worse treatment than one could imagine, one of the worst prisons that's existed uh, in human history. Uh, and so it's just, it's become kind of a, a non-question in Western Sahara. I once sat in a conversation of two anthropologists, one works in a city, one works in the mountains. And they said, that's the, the most interesting thing about Morocco is they will raise all sorts of questions about the legitimacy of the monarchy, but your average Moroccan doesn't even understand why Western Sahara is a question at all. It's, it's asking, you know, why, why, why aren't you willing to give up your left arm? Mm. Can I also chime in here? Yes, please. Um, I think one of the reasons is that uh, Morocco has systematically lied to the people about this issue ever since 1975, when the decision of the court, International Court of Justice came out. The first thing that King Hassan did is he had a press conference and he declared that the court had found in favor of Morocco. And ever since that time, he's been telling people that the court found in favor of their rights, that they have legal rights to the territory, that um, you know, they, the Sahrawis don't have any rights to claim uh, self-determination there. Um, he, he has declared uh, everything that is against the, the true legal aspect of this case. Um, and that is the propaganda that's been promulgated all these years for the, uh, the people in Morocco. So, of course, they're not going to <laughs> think that there's anything uh, to these claims of, of the Sahrawis for independence. Of course not. So let's turn to the question of the African Union in this. Um, the uh, Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic was a founding member of the African Union. And at a point when Morocco was, uh, had withdrawn from the OAU. Uh, and uh, I know the AU has, uh, at least on the books, supported self-determination for the Sarari people. Uh, but what I don't get a sense of is actually, Ambassador, with all due respect, what are they doing? Are, is the African Union doing anything? Because it appears that the Moroccans are trying to peel away one country after another 
that may have at one point supported the Sararis and peel them over to the side of the Moroccan occupation? Or am I overstating this? Well, this is, um, in fact, a, a, an interesting question and uh, should be indeed uh, brought up in our discussion. What is the role of the African Union? And as you rightly said, uh, now, after 2017, both the Sahara Republic and Morocco are sitting together within the African Union. And to begin with, this is an African problem uh, between two member states of the uh, African Union. And it was thanks to the erstwhile organization of African unity that the question of Western Sahara got to the United Nations Security Council, not the General Assembly, the General Assembly in the 60s, but it was uh, based on a recommendation by the African Continental Organization that uh, efforts we made jointly by the UN and OEU to bring the question to the Security Council and the settlement plan was adopted based on a uh, UN resolution. The problem now, uh, which limits the role of the African Union is that Morocco, which uh, now is a member of the organization, is opposed to any involvement by the African Union in the question of Western Sahara, being supported uh, obviously by key members like France when it comes to the uh, Security Council. And there is a very strange and awkward situation, to be honest, because we're talking about an African country which still occupies illegally parts of another African country. Africa, the symbol of resistance to colonialism, Africa, of which 55 countries were all colonies, except as you uh, may know two countries, Ethiopia and Liberia. So we in Africa know what it takes to resist colonialism. Uh, but the strange situation, as I said, is to see not on a European or a farm occupier, but a domestic occupier that still uh, occupies parts of another African country. Now this, uh, the, the, the question that we refer to, and I think it's bigger than the, uh, the question we're dealing with, uh, uh, and it's larger, uh, those governments, and I uh, insist on the word governments, not African peoples, who uh, side and align themselves with the Moroccan positions are those who receive instructions, unfortunately, from foreign capitals when it comes to African issues. But for us as Sahrawis, as Africans, we uh, stress and we have stressed that, that this is an African problem that should be resolved within the, the African unions. We do have the tools and the will and the history for uh, dealing with this kind of issues. The problem is that we are not being left alone the foreign interference is still there in Africa, and that's unfortunately is impacting negatively, not only in the question of Western Sahara, but also other questions dealing with, with development and security of, and even the unity of the continent. But that's, that's as I said, a, a, another issue, which was bigger than the issue we're dealing with. No, no, this is very, very important. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, and I, I wanna ask you, the three of you, uh, to comment on a couple more questions, and then we're going to wrap up. One is, um, and I don't know whether I'm overstating this, but I've had this growing fear of a regional conflict in Northwest Africa. Um, it's not only that the war is uh, recommenced between uh, the Polisario and the Moroccan occupiers, but Algeria and, and Morocco, who, which never had good relations, as you pointed out, Ambassador, Algeria broke diplomatic relations with Morocco after a series of provocative steps by the Moroccan government. Um, France remains there supporting Morocco, but then there are non-state actors like the Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb or Daesh that are there. And I keep wondering, is, this, is there a potential for some sort of regional explosion or is that an exaggeration of the situation? And I'd like all three of you to comment on that. Whoever wants to go. Okay, well, I'll, yeah, I'll just say that certainly uh, the potential is there. You do have, as you mentioned, a number of non-state actors in the region uh, who've been uh, over the past two decades uh, been causing uh, significant degradation of the security situation, uh, which was definitely um, 
uh, phenomenon that was put on steroids following the collapse of the Libyan state under a hail of NATO bombs in 2011, which unleashed a torrent of weapons across the Sahara Sahel. And that's when we saw the collapse of the, the state in northern Mali and the rise of an Islamic State affiliate based out of Timbuktu. Um, and that situation has only been exacerbated by the forms of foreign intervention we've seen from the, the French and the United States in terms of counterterrorism policy. But right now, uh, if you look at Islamic State activity worldwide, central th this region, the Sahel region and sort of central West Africa is the number one uh, place where we see this kind of violent activity. I mean, you look at massacres in the Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger triangle area is just, it's out of control. But at a larger geopolitical scale, the tensions between Morocco and Algeria has certainly never been as uh, high as they are now in recent memory. Um, and it's difficult to see how those tensions will be deflated in large part because Trump's uh, offer to recognize sovereignty of uh, Morocco's sovereignty or Western Sahara from the United States has really emboldened Morocco to go on a kind of diplomatic offensive that has uh, you know, seen almost no bounds in terms of taking on Germany, uh, forcing the Spanish government to reshuffle its candidate because they didn't like the foreign minister. Uh, you know, uh, Morocco's hubris at this moment uh, seems uh, boundless. And so I think that's the, that's the real danger in this moment. Thank you. Uh, we have just a few more minutes, but Ambassador or Caitlin, do you want to add anything to that? Um, well, I, I just want to say that uh, it's because of the resolution of a conflict of Western Sahara that we're having the situation we have now. If it were not for the Moroccan illegal occupation of parts of Western Sahara, we would have not got to this stage of to make this. This is the main problem that uh, we should uh, uh, bear in mind, and that implies the need. Uh, for a speedy solution to this problem. If you really want to restore peace and stability in North Africa and open up the prospects for integration, the much needed integration between the old components of, of, of the Maghreb. And I just uh, briefly want to say that um, part of what is now being done at the level of the Security Council and even beyond is trying to you know, base this solution on an understanding of realism and political realism, the fact that Morocco is there, it has strong allies and this and that, and it's there to stay. But what they seem to lose sight of, part of this realism and this realistic way of understanding the conflict of West Sahara, is this persistent fact of a small people unaided by France or the United States that could resist Morocco being aided by all these major powers. So that's in, 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 in our view is a basic and essential fact that should be taken into account. The Sahrawi people have demonstrated that they want to live in peace, but a just peace. And they have made tremendous concessions for that to materialize. And then they will not go away they will resist and continue to resist. Small have perhaps few strong friends, but they are convinced and strongly uh, able to resist any injustice. And what they ask at the end of the day is just one day to tell the world whether they want to be Saharaos and they are or want to be something else. And I think this is not too much to ask. Thank you. Caitlin, final comment? Well, I only have one comment. For many years now, Morocco has tried to um, in, tried to convince the U.S. government that it needs uh, the support of the United States to quell Islamic terrorism in the in the region, and has tried to portray the Polisarios being Islamic terrorists, and they're not. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. In fact, the terrorists terrorism that has occurred in the region has been quelled to some extent by the Polisario. And so that should be taken into consideration. Thank you. Well, I, we're at the, just a couple of more minutes and ending uh, towards ending this program. And I wanna thank the three of you, Ambassador Sidi Omar from the Frente Polisario and the Sarari Arab Democratic Republic, Caitlin Thomas, formerly with Mimerso and author of a great book I wanna add, 
because I've read this. Sometimes people say it's a great book, but they've never read the book. The Emperor's Clothes, The Naked Truth About Western Sahara, definitely worth reading. And Dr. Jacob Mundy, Professor and Director of Peace and Conflict Studies at Colgate University and co-author of Western Sahara, More Nationalism and Conflict Irresolution. You know, for you, the listeners and viewers, please um, understand that there's much that you can do. One thing I want to suggest is go to the website of the campaign to end the Moroccan occupation of the Western Sahara, freewesternsahara.org, and take a look at what's there. Uh, indicate your interests, make, make contributions. We're, you know, get in contact with us. If there's, uh, if you're looking for speakers, we have a speakers bureau we're putting together and we're building out. We want to make this a real grassroots effort to change thinking in this country and policy. Because to go back to something that Caitlin was saying, the United States is not a uh, unbiased party in this. We're directly responsible for the actions that contributed to the, the way that the Spanish withdrew and the, in fact, the Moroccan invasion. So we owe the people of the Western Sahara a major debt and we can repay it. So we need that, we need your involvement. I wanna thank the Institute for the Black World 21st Century and the Pan-African Unity Dialogue for making this possible. And I wanna thank you, the listeners and viewers for taking the time out on, I know your busy schedule to view this and to participate. And we look forward to reconnecting with us the next time in this webinar series on the Western Sahara. Thank my thanks, take care, have a good and safe evening and the struggle continues. Good night now.